Before there was a New Bedford, before there was a Fairhaven, there was a body of water that separated the two lands. The only inhabitants were Native Americans, who had lived here for hundreds of years. They were a quiet and peaceful people who fished the waters of the harbor and bay and hunted deer and rabbit and farmed the land, growing squash, pumpkin, and corn. By most standards, the harbor New Bedford shares with Fairhaven is really not that large. It is difficult to imagine what it may have been like with no bridges, no buildings, or people. In the grand scheme of passing time, man is a recent development. The Indians who lived in the land surrounding the great river that forms the New Bedford Fairhaven Harbor were known to have belonged to three distinct Wampanoag tribes. The Kushnias lived in New Bedford, Fairhaven, and Akushnet. To the west, the Ponagansets occupied Dartmouth, and Westport lands were primarily inhabited by the Coxets. They lived a simple life based on need and survival. They hunted and fished, and in general led a peaceful life. As history shows, it was the introduction of the white man who upset their balance of life. We lived in a small village close to the water. Our family were tarred in the fields, growing corn and squash, and the men were always away, hunting for deer or fishing in the great waters. Many times, visitors from Plymouth would stop to trade items we needed for the winter or the next season. They were on their way to visit Nipbuck villages, where the hunting and fishing were good. To cross our river, the men had made a small bridge from the wood of trees near our village. The water passed slowly and quietly under the bridge and soon came to a great bay with villages on the shores. Some villagers fished from the shore and some from small boats. Our Witu was not crowded and we all worked to make sure it was covered well to stop the sky water and snow from entering. Our Mother Earth always made sure that the flowing waters of our Kushnia River was cold and pure. We used the waters for drinking and for our cooking and heating animal skins. The origin of the Akushnet River, which makes up all of the New Bedford Fairhaven Harbor, lies a few miles to the north near what was the original New Bedford Water Reservoir. Small streams and a natural water table form tiny rivulets that flow south to become a major waterway that now supports many different types of commerce. The first known crossing of the river remains in the same place today as it was when the Indians traveled from what is now Plymouth to Rhode Island. The original head of the river bridge was constructed in the mid to late 1700s. Soldiers of the Revolutionary War damaged the bridge and a storm destroyed what was left in 1815. The work on a stone double arch bridge at this location was started in 1828 and finished in 1829. It was strengthened and rehabilitated in 1959, adding a new wider surface that now hides the arches beneath, but they're still there. For many years, its arches were exposed and many stopped to take a photo or even paint one of the most attractive of all the bridges crossing the river. The second bridge to cross the river was located three miles to the south. In 1796, it was the first New Bedford Fairhaven Bridge, and it was a flimsy structure that even the smallest storms would close. It was built as a toll bridge by a private partnership, and tolls of four cents for a walker, 12 cents for a small carriage, and 36 cents for a larger four-wheel carriage. 
It should be remembered that sailing and motorized ferries, as well as rowboats, played an important part in crossing the river, although not for a large number of passengers. The best known way to cross the river remains the New Bedford Fairhaven Bridge, because the harbor and Buzzards Bay face south and narrows at their northern ends, it forms the perfect shape for damaging winds, water, and storms. Two foot normal astronomical tide, and then tides 15 feet above normal, the surge is that 15 feet. Some mariners refer to this as a storm tide of 17 feet, two plus the 15. But what we, when we say tides a certain number of feet above normal, we're referring to just the surge portion. So 15 foot storm surge. Now of that 15 feet, 14 feet of it is due to the, the winds pushing, driving that water higher and higher. And about one foot of it is due to the lower atmospheric pressure, where actually the uh, less pressure on the ocean surface makes it rise up a little bit. Uh, but that's only one out of the 15 feet. Most of it is due to the, to the uh, strong winds creating that surge. Now that doesn't even account for the wave action on top of it, which is what really does in the structures. Now along the south coast of New England, southeastern part in particular, we have all kinds of nuances along the area. Some higher elevation people that are okay and lower elevation people that are not so okay. We also have the shape of Buzzards Bay. Buzzards Bay is our ground zero for the worst case scenario of a hurricane hitting southern New England. Uh, and what I mean by that is from a storm no worse than Carol or the 38 hurricane which passed across Connecticut, had those storms been passing across Narragansett Bay, then the strong winds and the corresponding storm surge would be funneled up Buzzards Bay. And because of the shape of it, it has nowhere to go up in the northern portion of Buzzards Bay until the storm is way past us and the wind shifts direction and it can, is allowed to uh, come out of Buzzards Bay. So therefore, at the northern part of Buzzards Bay, places like Wareham, Parkwood Beach in Wareham in, in particular, our models show that someday a 28-foot storm surge could occur. And the most that anybody can remember is a 13-foot storm surge. Because in the 38 hurricane and the Carol, uh, as bad as it was, and 13 feet is nothing to sneeze at, we're talking about double what anybody has in their memories, or even more, in some of those locations. There's complete devastation, and people who can't see the bay from where they are, the elevation doesn't change down the street, even a half a mile or a mile away, don't realize that their house could be overtopped from the storm. Now here in New Bedford, we're actually lucky that we have the hurricane barrier to protect most of the city, uh, and it's able to withstand a 20-foot uh, storm surge, and our models show that in the worst case scenario here, we would be getting a 16-foot storm surge, so that's a good thing. But in other places along the coast, we have some big, big problems. The great gale of September 1869 destroyed the bridge once again, and the public was demanding a toll-free, sturdy way to cross. Finally, in the late 1890s, construction began on a strong metal wingspan bridge with stronger approaches and sturdy roadways across the harbor. Trolleys crossed the bridge and a car barn was constructed on Pope's Island to store the trolleys at night. A fancy building housing the New Bedford Yacht Club was built on the south side of the roadway and seven acres of fill created a public park nearby. That's now known as Marine Park. At a cost of $1.2 million, the bridge finally opened in 1902. The great unnamed hurricane of 1938 caused serious damage to the bridge, destroying the Yacht Club, much of the Nye Oil Company on Fish Island, a number of homes on the island, and the bridge itself. Because it had become such an important link in the commerce of the two cities and towns beyond, priority was given to fix the structure. In 1958, the New Bedford Seafood Council and the Exchange Club joined forces to create a hugely popular scallop festival every summer that ended because it became too big. In the 1980s and 1990s, the 100-year-old bridge suffered a series of mechanical breakdowns, lasting from a few days to as long as six months. 
Residents and businesses on the bridge and on the mainland became frustrated. With all its changes and upgrades, the bridge remains essentially the same, and in early 2012, it was once again closed for a major rehab. We're here this afternoon with Mr. Daniel Corovo. And Dan, who are you with? I'm with Mass DOT's Highway Division, and I'm the District 5 bridge engineer out of Taunton. And I take it District 5 encompasses Greater New Bedford? Uh, all of southeastern Mass, uh, the Cape, and the islands. Now, the work that you've been doing here on the Fairhaven New Bedford Bridge started how far back? Uh, it's been almost three weeks. It'll be three weeks this coming Sunday. Um, we've been working on the bridge 24 hours a day, uh, doing a whole series of upgrades, the most significant of which is an electrical upgrade, where um, we've replaced all of the electric motors that operate the bridge, that uh, open the bridge, that operate the gates, that uh, prevent traffic from traveling to the draw span when it's opening. Um, all 14 motors have been removed and replaced. Uh, the reason we've done this is because uh, in February 2011 we had a transformer explosion um, that cut off power to the bridge and working with our partners at NSTAR um, have worked out an arrangement with them to uh, replace that transformer and supply the bridge with a more reliable voltage that uh, meets current uh, standards, 480 volts. So the work that you've been doing here on the bridge is something that absolutely needed to be done, obviously. And would you consider it to be a, a reconstruction of the bridge? Uh, reconstruction of um, elements of the bridge, the most important being the electrical service upgrade and replacement of all the motors. Um, we've done other work concurrently since having the bridge closed to traffic has given us an opportunity to work on other parts of the bridge that uh, need, need work badly. Um, we've done repairs to um, the very ends of the draw span uh, because they had been damaged uh, over the years. Um, we repaired uh, the lower cord of uh, one of the trusses in order to uh, correct some section loss, some corrosion that occurred there. Um, Dan, tell me, does any of the work that you, your men have been doing here tie into the rebuilding of Route 18? Uh, it's a whole separate activity. Um, we do have a lot of work going on at this location. We have a separate contractor doing work on all the approach spans to uh, the draw span here as well. Uh, through the years there have been obviously a number of uh, occasions when the bridge has not functioned properly. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the future and what we've got to look forward to? Um, yeah, we've been doing a whole series of upgrades to the, the swing span to improve its reliability. Um, Obviously, the electrical upgrade was important because it was running on an old industrial era voltage that's not supported anymore. So now that we have the bridge operating on a 480 volt supply, um, its reliability will be improved. We'll have a whole new series of electric motors in place. Uh, given that they're brand new, obviously they should have a fairly extended surface, uh, service life. Uh, two years ago, we also replaced the hydraulic system on the bridge, all the pipes that pump hydraulic fluid out to the jacks that lift the bridge up um, when we do an opening. Um, we've replaced all those pipes with stainless steel, so obviously from a corrosion perspective it's a, a very durable material. So we're taking steps um, to improve the reliability and long-term performance of the bridge so that we won't have those interruptions. That's great. I'm sure people are going to yeah. like to hear that. Um, just about the last question I have for you is uh, and I think I know the answer to this, the speed at which the bridge opens and closes, that is or is not going to change? Um, I don't believe it's going to change significantly. The duration of um, the delays to traffic when the bridge opens and closes, um, aren't. it's not going to be shortened extensively. Um, we don't want to speed up the, the movement of the bridge to any great degree because there could be uh, performance issues related to that that we don't want to do. We don't want to do anything to the bridge that will stress it uh, beyond what it's accustomed to. Yeah. And the the other question I had was, how often does this bridge open and close? Um, by regulation, it's uh, it opens hourly uh, on uh, when there is a need for an opening. We have bridge operators that uh, have radio contact with the mariners that uh, are informed if anyone's waiting to come in or go out. Um, and uh, there is an hourly schedule. I think in the morning it opens at the top of the hour up to, I think, 10 a.m. and then 11.15 uh, in 15 minutes past the hour all the way up to uh, 
dinner time. Dan, I know you're really a busy guy, and I want to thank you, and we really appreciate your taking time out to talk to our audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ed. It's been a pleasure. The third bridge to straddle the river went from Spooner's Point in Fairhaven to Cogsall Street on the New Bedford side. It was completed in 1892 at a cost of $50,000 and was a fairly ornate metal structure that was popularly known simply as the Cogsall Street Bridge. Eventually, a series of hurricanes in the 1950s damaged it so badly it was closed and replaced by a causeway with a single opening in the center. Bridge number four was important because it connected a large industrial area of New Bedford with a growing residential area of Fairhaven. Additionally, it relieved some of the traffic that had been clogging the Cogsall Street Bridge and the head of the River Bridge. Shortly after it opened in 1930, it was said that all of the house lots in Fairhaven had been sold and were being developed into single-family dwellings. While it has no official name, locals generally call it, the Wood Street Bridge. The last and most modern bridge was finished and in service in 1959 with the completion of the Interstate 195 project that connects Providence, Rhode Island with Cape Cod. It is a causeway similar to the Cogsall Street connector and carries the largest volume of traffic. While not a bridge, there is one more structure crossing the harbor. Built in the mid-1960s, the New Bedford Hurricane Barrier stands as a giant of ingenuity. It is, in fact, the largest stone structure on the east coast of the United States. The barrier is 30 and a half miles long and 20 feet high. It is built with giant granite boulders quarried in nearby South Dartmouth. It is the placement of the boulders that makes the barrier so effective. The riprap irregular placement of the stones allow for the wall to absorb the force of any wave or storm surge. While it may look haphazard, each rock was placed carefully, allowing for space to channel the crashing waves. The roadway on top was incorporated into the design to allow emergency vehicles quick access to any part of the barrier. Two giant gates, each weighing 400 tons, are shaped like pie wedges and move on their fulcrum point to a closed position. It takes 12 minutes to close the gates, and they are closed a number of times every year whenever there is an unusually high tide. There have been a number of hurricanes since the barrier was built, and the barrier worked fine. Boats of all sizes and shapes pass through the gates 24 hours a day. Small pleasure boats, ferries, barges, 
ocean-going cargo vessels, and most commonly fishing boats heading for the fishing grounds hundreds of miles in the Atlantic. Currently, it is estimated that 300 of these fishing boats call New Bedford their home port. New Bedford and its sister port of Fairhaven share the waters of the Acushnet River that we simply call the harbor. It is a busy place with beautiful pleasure boats docked at the city-owned Pope's Island Marina to the Fairhaven shipyard where giant boats of many types are raised onto land where full repairs to their hulls may be done. This then is the New Bedford Harbor, the Acushnet River actually, and crossing it has always proved to be an interesting challenge. Keep a great thing growing, America. Tree City, USA. The Arbor Day Foundation invites you to put down roots and plant trees in your community. You'll see an amazing transformation. Trees clear the air, clean the water, and conserve energy. As much as we need trees, we need to plan, plant, and care for them. Support Tree City USA where you live. Go to arborday.org to learn which trees to plant where and how to care for them. At arborday.org, you can contact your state forester for community forestry assistance. Keep a great thing growing, America. Tree City, USA. Did you know that students with learning or physical disabilities are 65% more likely to be bullied than their peers? When bullying behavior crosses the line and becomes disability harassment, it's against the law. Harassment can include verbal, written, and physical threats. If you're being bullied, remember, it's not your fault. It's important to tell someone like your parent or a teacher if you're being bullied because bullying affects everybody. If you see bullying but don't know what to do or don't feel safe stepping in, there are things that you can still do to help. Tell an adult about it. Be kind to the person being bullied at another time. Talk with them and spend time with them. For more information on what you can do to stop bullying, go to www.stopbullying.gov. Take a stand, lend a hand, stop bullying now. This public service announcement was brought to you by the Butterfly Project, a City of New Bedford's Invest in Kids program, the Women's Fund, and the Community Foundation of Southeastern Massachusetts.